This is the incredible story of a group of Allied officers attempting the impossible, to break out from one of Germany's most brutal and secure prisoner of war camps. They were doing things that were, what you would have said, were absolutely impossible. They spent nine frantic months digging a tunnel with improvised tools, facing asphyxiation and the threat of being buried alive. It's very, very, very dangerous. Retracing their daring escape plan, we delve into the officers' personal diaries, explore the camp, examine historical archives. It's ingenious, isn't it? And interview key experts. There's a far greater likelihood that they would fail than that they would succeed. Go back! But this was not World War II and no Steve McQueen movie. They were prepared to risk their lives to outwit the Hun. This was World War I, and this was the first great escape. In 1916, one of the deadliest and bloodiest conflicts in history was raging. On land, at sea, and in the air, the death toll ran into millions. On the 17th of September 1916, 32-year-old Royal Flying Corps officer Captain David Gray was on a mission over northern France at the helm of his wooden biplane. Gray had thus far beaten the odds. A pilot's average life expectancy was just 18 hours in the air, and the Royal Flying Corps was losing 12 aircraft and 20 crew every day. Being an airman in the First World War necessitated a particular kind of mentality. It was a very dangerous job. Uh, these were men who were particularly adventurous, who chose this line of work, and it attracted people who were quite fatalistic, who didn't really fear death. But Gray's luck was about to run out. Attacked by nine German Fokkers, his engine was struck by machine gun fire. In a spin, and only 150 metres from the ground, Gray regained control and landed. Amazingly unscathed, he was soon surrounded by German soldiers, and he became one of Germany's 2.4 million prisoners of war. Gray was now a POW, but it wasn't in his character to accept defeat. A British officer is generally a fairly frustrated being. He's expecting a war of action. He suddenly ends up in the POW camp in a war of inaction. He has to try and find a way of striking back against the Germans. And the most spectacular form of resistance, and they do regard it as resistance, really fighting back against the Germans, is actually getting out. In just a year, Gray made five escape attempts from several different POW camps. They were all unsuccessful. The German authorities were keen to crush Gray's rebellious spirit. He was transferred to Germany's most brutal POW officer camp, Holzminden. Holzminden was known by the internees as Helminden, and, and I think with good reason, because it was overcrowded, Spartan conditions in the room, sometimes 14 or more in a single room. They slept on mattresses filled with wood shavings, not even straw. They had a couple of blankets which were never changed, one dirty sheet. I mean, these are pretty grim conditions, and they were added to, of course, by the camp regime. The Kaiser's regime was absolutely brutal to British prisoners of war. For my estimate, at least 552 British officers of the ranks were murdered by German guards. That's either being shot or beaten to death. Um, these were dangerous places. The regime in Holzminden was especially brutal because of one man. Camp Commandant Karl Niemeyer. And the prisoners at his mercy loathed him. The Commandant was vile. He treated his dependents as beings of another world, like dogs. 
the knowledge of his power was his main solace. And there is no doubt that he often stirred up trouble in the camp for the sake of trouble. He tried to intimidate everyone. He thundered and damned and cursed as he flayed them with his tongue. He was uh, capricious in the way he ran the camp. He would impose the most draconian punishments for the most trivial offences. People would get three or four days solitary confinement in the punishment cells just for having a hot water bottle in their room in the depths of winter. Niemeyer also prided himself on the belief that his camp was the most secure POW facility in Germany. The main gates were heavily fortified and the perimeter fence floodlit by arc lamps. 100 German guards controlled more than 600 prisoners who were housed in two secure barracks. The exercise yard was enclosed by a double fence running either side of a no-man's land. This area was continuously patrolled by attack dogs and armed sentries ready to shoot on sight. At the far end was a wall crowned with barbed wire. At least 19 POWs had attempted to escape from Holzminden since it opened in September 1917, but all had failed. You see, gentlemen, you cannot get out now. I should not try. It will be bad for your health. This was like a red rag to a bull to the officers. They were determined to take up the challenge and get out. But it wasn't only hatred for the camp commandant that drove the POWs. It was an emasculating experience to be trapped in a camp and passive at a point when many other men were being tested on the field of battle. An escape could often come from patriotism and a desire to prove oneself again after the shame of surrender. And these guys feel very, very badly that this kind of personal honour has been um, affected and damaged in their own eyes, in the eyes of their regiment, in the eyes of their country, in the eyes of their family, in the eyes of their school. How do they redeem themselves? by attempting to escape. Arriving at Holzminden in January 1918, Gray began looking for accomplices amongst the 600 imprisoned Allied officers, and he soon found two suitable candidates. Captain Kaspar Kennard's reputation had preceded him. A determined 26-year-old, Kennard had spent six weeks in solitary confinement following a failed breakout from a previous camp. Second Lieutenant Cecil Blaine, a 22-year-old airman, saw escape as a necessary form of action and had also notched up a number of prior attempts. The camp was heavily guarded, and after a meticulous inspection, the trio realised there was only one way to beat the formidable security measures in place. The only way you're going to escape this industrial prison machine is you're going to have to use the industrial tactics that you know from the front. How are you going to get out? You're going to tunnel. And there was already a tunnelling operation in place that Gray, Blaine and Kennard were destined to eventually lead. Conceived the previous November by a Canadian officer, Major Colcoon, the plan was to tunnel a distance of over 10 metres from the cellars of Barracks B to a point just beyond the perimeter wall once out, the aim was to make a 240-kilometre dash to neutral Holland and back to Britain. This was going to require months of gruelling work, and for the 20 officers involved, the stakes couldn't have been higher. The Germans certainly weren't playing games. Um, if you were caught trying to escape as an officer or indeed in other ranks, it was quite likely you'd be shot. November 1917, Holzminden, Germany's most secure POW camp. 20 Allied officers planned to dig a tunnel right under the noses of their German captors and escape. One hundred years after the start of the First World War, Holzminden is still in use by the German army. This is it, Michael. This is the German barracks from Holzminden. British historian Saul David has gained rare access to the camp. He is here with local expert Michael Melching to see exactly where the tunnelling operation began. 
Following a methodical reconnaissance, the location chosen for the start of the tunnel was in the cellars of Barracks B, below the orderlies' quarters. The closest point to the perimeter wall only 10 metres away. Saul and Michael are going to see the tunnel entrance firsthand. So, Michael, this is the orderly's entrance. Yes, it's true, it's right. And the officers have had to come through this entrance so they could do the digging downstairs. Yes, it's true. And it, the entrance is down below. Can we go down and have a look? Yes, have a look there. The officers needed to keep their covert tunnelling operation from the prying eyes of the German guards. So here it is, Michael. Am I right in thinking that during the tunnelling there would have been a wooden partition here and also here so that when they're working in there nobody can see them? Yes, it's right. Accounts from the escapers themselves reveal they used stolen tools to cut a hole in the wooden partition and built a secret door allowing access to the cellars. Can we actually see the entrance to the tunnel through here? Yes, sir. OK. We have a look. So please come in. Here is the room mm -hmm. to the entry from the tunnel. At this place, uh -huh. on the wall, there are the beginning of the tunnel. Ah, I see. So gone. that's where they started digging? Yes. The brickwork's changed and the mortar colours change from, from white here to and there it is, it's brown and the, and the red of the brick, and obviously that's where they've repaired the original hole in the wall. Michael, if it's cramped in here, imagine what it must have been like in that tunnel, just 16 inches high. Yes. You know, the claustrophobia, the feeling of the cramped Very small space, tunnel, the, very small the tunnel. The stones, the earth, it's uncomfortable, you can't many breathe. Many stones, many stones. I think I'd have been one of the officers in the bed upstairs. They are, <laughs> that's true. The first major obstacle was how to break through the concrete foundations of the barracks. For this they used an improvised chisel and some sulfuric acid obtained from a bribed civilian workman to melt the steel reinforcement rods. They could now start tunnelling. <coughs> To reach freedom, the 20 men would have to dig a distance of over 10 metres. Working at depths of up to 3 metres, the tunnelling conditions were extreme. The tunnel was just large enough to admit a man's body lying flat, there being no headroom for crawling on hands and knees. You had to wriggle or worm your way along it, and working your way backwards to escape the tunnel, obviously there was no room to turn round, proved even more time-consuming. It was difficult to become accustomed to the feeling of being buried alive when working at the tunnel face. Digging was done, and terribly hard work it was, being so cramped. An hour and a half was about as much as one could stand. The officers worked in groups of threes between the 9am and 5pm roll calls. <coughs> Without access to mining tools, they had to rely on their improvisational skills and ingenuity. <coughs> no patent gadgets were used at all. We dug with table knives where there was soil and progged about with a cold chisel and bits of rake through the stone. They were pretty tough in their early 20s, or very early 20s, very young and pretty resilient. A generation where you just got on with it. I mean, amazing, amazing tenacity to... Uh, yeah, they just wanted to get home, you know, they really, really wanted to get home, I think. Once he'd excavated enough material to fill an enamel bowl he'd pushed in front of him, he'd force the bowl back and then tug on a rope attached to it to tell his mate back in the chamber to pull the bowl back. There was barely enough room for the loaded basin to pass the man's body, and it was considered a good day's work if a foot of progress was made. <laughs> the working party also faced another serious problem. How to hide tons of excavated soil from their German guards. The soil and rubble were disposed of by filling mattress covers stolen from our quarters, and these were stored under the staircase. Those men had to have absolutely iron determination. 
because they were doing things that were, what you would have said, were absolutely impossible. <coughs> By early December 1917, the tunnelers were a month into their dig. By excavating up to a foot of earth a day, they had covered approximately six metres and were now halfway to their proposed exit point. But as the men dug further, a problem arose which jeopardised the entire escape mission. All of them complained of blinding headaches, and they couldn't spend more than an hour at the face without having to be replaced by the next man. The further they got, the worse the air became as well, which debilitated them still further. Air became a hard problem to solve. The fellows working sometimes had to be dragged out by their comrades in a state of collapse, and with a head like a dozen hives of bees. <coughs> and the further the men dug, the less oxygen there was to breathe. In London, historian Heather Jones is on her way to meet a mechanical engineer who can reveal the tunneler's ingenious solution to this problem. Using some of the limited materials the tunnelers had at their disposal, Todd Todashini has built a primitive air pump out of salvaged wood and a leather flying jacket. So what I've done is I've just sewn up uh, on the inside there. So although it looks like it's buttoned up, it's actually mm -hmm. been sewn. Uh, the whole inside has been smeared with uh, a sealing compound. Uh, and then I've just sewn yeah. up one sleeve and the other sleeve is the output for our bellows. Mm -hmm. So all you do is there's a foot plate that you stand on. So you bend down, you just open the two bars up you enclose a volume of air, uh -huh. you do that, push down, and that's it. And you can see the volume of air that's coming through the sleeve that would, yeah. go, would have gone into the pipes. It's very effective. Exactly. The tunnelers collected biscuit and shaving tins and constructed a piping system to funnel air to the man digging at the face. So, Todd, can you show me where exactly the, the can pipeline would have been attached to the bellows? Um, well, basically, I've sewn up one sleeve, so that's sealed. Left the other one on here, and of course, it's just a natural... So here's a, a length of pipe that I've made. Mm -hmm. So that very simply just fits in the sleeve here, Great. and then it's just tied on there. Uh, simple as that, really. Then a little bit of sealing compound of some kind just to minimise the air losses. Uh, so we've got here... This is a great sealing compound for the leather, in fact. Mm -hmm. And this great. is a mixture of lard and beeswax. It so feels you can feel... disgusting. Yeah, it's <laughs> great. If you rub it on the leather, for instance, wherever you've got seams on the inside, mm -hmm. you can really smear it in, yeah. and that will help to seal it. We've got here some rosin. So this is actually what violinists used to put on their bows. And there was an orchestra in the camp, so they may well have had access to this as well. But you can mix these things in different ways and it gives you slightly different properties depending mm -hmm. what you're looking for. This handmade contraption is a testament to the officer's ability to make use of absolutely everything they could lay their hands on to aid their escape. This wouldn't have been that effective, would it? It would have been kind of a way of staving off asphyxiation from carbon monoxide, but it wouldn't really have provided no. enough air for a man to stay underground for hours and hours. No, it's, it, it's going to help, but they're going to be rebreathing, as you say, a lot of carbon monoxide, and that's the classic one that you get headaches from. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to change a working shift from 10 minutes into an hour or something like that. So it's going to allow them to do the work, but it's still nasty down there. So, yeah, you asked me to go down that tunnel, and I think I would really struggle with that, actually. With one of the men in the working party constantly operating the bellows, digging could continue. But they were now acutely aware that the more earth they excavated, the more hazardous their job became. Digging a tunnel ran a very high risk of failure. It was extremely difficult to stop tunnels from collapsing, so they used boards from the beds to improvise supports for the tunnel. They stole these from other prisoners who wondered where their bedboards had gone to. A plank would be wedged across the top of the tunnel and they then brace planks either side to support it. But unfortunately, there weren't even enough bedboards in the whole camp to revet the tunnel all the way through. In most places, it was braced only every two or three yards, leaving ample opportunity for roof walls in between. 
Digging a tunnel was an extreme method of escape, but risking their lives was something these officers had already had to face on a daily basis. The reality was that many of the men in Holtzminden had come from the horrors of trench warfare, which were really extreme. They'd seen bodies blown apart by shells. They'd seen people lacerated by machine gun fire. This was a particularly horrific war experience on the Western Front. All the escapers just wanted to get out of it and get home and get at the Hun again. You know, they all wanted to, they had this wonderful term. They always referred to the Germans as the Hun. And uh, I think they just, you know, wanted to do their bit for England and that was it. By Christmas 1917, the Holzminden tunnelers had cleared the camp's perimeter wall, a total distance of more than 10 metres. After two months of perilous work, they were now ready to break out. But then disaster struck. It may have been because of another escape attempt, or it may merely have been the rumour of one that persuaded the commandant, Karl Niemeyer, to increase the number of guards. Three more were stationed outside the camp, including one almost directly over the place where the tunnel was to emerge. Sentries now patrolled both sides of the perimeter wall and directly over the spot where the tunnelers had decided to surface. Any hope of escape was now crushed. You can only imagine the despair they must have felt to be that close and suddenly to have that hope dashed from them. The tunnelers were now facing an agonising dilemma. Admit defeat or spend months tunnelling a further 40 metres to the cover afforded by a rye field. Over three times the distance they had already dug. They now had a choice. Either carry on digging a gruelling 40 metres to the cover of a field of rye or give up. Many did quit but the arrival of a trio of determined airmen, Captain David Gray, Captain Caspar Kennard, and Second Lieutenant Cecil Blaine, provided new blood and renewed hope. Mustering a 13-strong band of escapees, the tunnelers were now back in business. I think what we have to remember about the British officer of this period is that he considered himself to be an officer and a gentleman, and they had a very strong sense of patriotism, uh, duty to their country, but also honour. And this honour was all part and parcel of the determination, at least for some of them, to escape, to do their bit, to try and hit back at the Germans. Tunnelling was a form of resistance, and if successful, it meant a large number of prisoners could break out in one go. Sick as we were to be foiled at the last moment through no fault of our own, we commenced again. But the officers were still 40 metres away from their new point of exit, and time was against them. They had to drive the tunnel as far as the first decent cover, which was provided by a rye field beyond the perimeter fence. They had to reach it, though, before the crop was harvested, which would occur in early August at the very latest. Digging 40 metres in six months with spoons and a bread knife was a tall order. They were now going to have to dig day and night. But getting back to England wasn't just about tunnelling. That was only the first part of a successful escape plan. Once they had broken out of the camp, the men had to reach neutral Holland, 240 kilometres away. This was going to require preparation, planning and supplies. Many had escaped before, many had been uh, brought to Holtzminden as inveterate escapers, they had tried this before, and, and they knew that they needed to have false papers. They knew the dangers of being stopped and searched. They knew the dangers of not being able to speak German properly, that these were, were factors that would likely get them caught during their escape, and also the dangers of needing to cross rivers and to cross the frontier into Holland. The officers recruited an extra 15 men, bringing their total to 28. This supplementary party was to help gather contraband essential to their run across Germany. Secret maps, civilian disguises, money and rations were hidden around the barracks. Hiding places lurked everywhere. There was hardly a room without its cash. There were sliding panels in the walls, 
false partitions in the cupboards, false bottoms in the drawers. Almost everything that ought to have been solid was hollow. Throughout the war, Allied prisoners regularly received Red Cross packages. Surprisingly, their families were also often able to send food parcels. Essential escape items were smuggled into the camp via these correspondences. At the Imperial War Museum in London, historian Heather Jones and curator Terry Charman are about to examine some of these escape artefacts. The first item they look at is a compass. Look at the size of it. It's, it's absolutely tiny. You could hide it in, in, in your shoe, as many of the prisoners actually and arriving in Hulsminden did. They hid their escaping kits in parts of their clothing, particularly the heels of their boots. Oh, so sorry. something like this could easily have been secreted in, in, in that way. Um, so it would escape the initial search on arrival at the camp. Right. And they would have used a compass as well to orientate the tunnel to try and discover what direction to dig in. That's correct as well, yes. I mean, it was a vital piece of escape. Absolutely. Probably one of the most important pieces of escape equipment, isn't it? Particularly in a country you didn't know, where you didn't know uh, yes, the route. Yes. Escapers had to be creative. They had to be innovative. And they had to work with what they could access. Secret maps, homemade moccasins, and folding wire cutters are some of the other items made or acquired by the tunnelers. This is a shaving brush that conceals a secret compartment, doesn't it, that an escaper used to hide maps? hide a map of the area that he's hoping to escape from and also we've got there a timetable of the trains of the local area so shall we see where the secret compartment let's, is let's, concealed let's see in, this, that, in, this, yes. in this item oh brilliant it's ingenious isn't it because it's an item that prisoners of war were allowed to have a very everyday mundane item and it has been used you can see he was clearly <laughs> shaving with yes. this item and yet, concealed in the base, are all the tools one needs to, 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 to escape from the country into neutral Holland. Yes. For the escaping officers, civilian clothing was to provide vital camouflage for their 240-kilometre run across Germany. So this is Captain Leggett's Panama hat that he wears during his escape from Holzminden. Uh, it's referred to as the most important part of an escaper's kit, the hat, because at this time men all wore hats and if you wore the wrong kind of hat in, in, in an escape attempt it could identify you immediately as an escaper. So this was a really key part of kit, wasn't it? It was vital to look as far as possible like an ordinary German civilian and in those days everybody everywhere wore straw hats and if you didn't wear one you would stand out considerably and by standing out you would also invite suspicion by it, the ordinary German. An attention which you didn't an want attention. to have. These artefacts would prove indispensable to the tunnelers, but no escape could have been possible without the collaboration of some of the camp guards. What's interesting about Holes Minden and other POW officer camps is that because the officers got so many parcels from home, including Red Cross parcels, they were actually probably better fed than the camp guards. If you were a soldier guarding those, officers, you were in a, on the starvation rationing because Germany's economy was collapsing. So these soldiers, the guards had very little food, their families were starving, and the, the British officers were able to bribe them. Vital information was also gathered in a most unlikely way. Another collaborator was a woman typist in the camp headquarters, who's supposed to have fallen in love with an, with an Australian airman, a man called Lyons. She used to drop down messages with obviously certain intelligence which was vital for the escapers. Without the tip-offs about when a search of the camp was going to take place and without the extra items being provided so that some of the prisoners could pass as civilians once they got out of the camp, which are being passed on to the prisoners by corrupt guards, uh, it's unlikely that the escape would have taken on anything like the dimensions that it did. By early June 1918, the tunnelers had been working for a total of seven months and were progressing towards the rye field. But below ground, conditions were deteriorating rapidly. The tunnel wove from side to side, it rose and fall because they couldn't keep a straight course with the primitive equipment and tools they had. The time it took to crawl to the face and back was ever increasing. And there was also another issue the men had to tackle. 
it was so winding and humpbacked that it was no longer possible to use our rope and basin method to dispose of the rubble. So we had to resort to filling the sacks we were working with and dragging them back through the tunnel. You have to imagine what it's like to dig a tunnel with a spoon. And you do that every day for nine months by yourself underground with a spoon for hours and hours and hours with no sense that you would necessarily succeed. They were literally amateurs trying to dig deep underground, an industry that we know miners died in their hundreds. So it's very, very, very dangerous. It was mid-June 1918, and the tunnelers reckoned they only had a few metres to dig before reaching the cover of the rye field. But they were now in a desperate race against the clock. Every time they looked towards the rye fields, they could see it growing higher and the dark green beginning to change to the gold that would show it was ripening. To emerge into open ground would have just been suicide. They would have been either apprehended at once or they would have been shot while trying to escape. Finally, on the last day in June, the tunnelers estimated the distance from the barracks to the rye field had been reached. But without professional equipment, it was impossible to be certain. And in the end, they felt the only solution was to send one of their number down with a long, thin rod with a piece of white rag attached to the end of it. He went to the face of the tunnel and then pushed it up through the ceiling above his head. To their horror, they saw that it had emerged about eight yards short of the rye crop in full view of a guard who was standing and looking in that direction at the time. By a miracle, he turned away and wandered on without raising the alarm. After another three weeks of frantic digging, the tunnelers found they were still three metres short. But time had run out and harvest was imminent. Their only hope for cover now was a thin row of beans. And they decided to take their chances. On the night of the 23rd of July, 1918, at around 10 o'clock, Lieutenant Walter Butler was the first man to crawl through the 55-metre tunnel. I was worming my way along the hole for the last time and feeling the weight of responsibility very much. I'm not ashamed to say that I did a bit of praying on the way along. When Butler reached the face, he went to work with a large bread knife. Less than an hour later, he broke ground. Nine months of planning and life-threatening tunnelling had finally paid off. And the greatest escape of the First World War could get underway. Dressed in civilian disguises and pushing bags containing maps and rations, some of the first to wriggle their way out were the tunnelling masterminds. Captain David Gray, Captain Caspar Kennard and Second Lieutenant Cecil Blaine. By 11.30, the first 13 tunnellers were on the run and swimming across the River Visa. The escape begins and it's divided according to merit. So the more work you put in on the tunnel, the earlier you go in the run. So the, you know, the first three out are the ones who work the hardest. And then you get to what they call the ruck. Second Lieutenant John Tullis was part of this second batch. Getting through that tunnel was a nightmare experience. The distance seemed endless as one pushed one's heavy pack along a couple of feet and then wormed after it. What's wrong? In one place, the slope was like going up the side of a house. I stuck at the bottom of this. Eventually, I crawled or wormed my way up with frequent rests to regain my breath. <laughs> By 4.30 a.m., 29 out of the 86 officers on the escape list had managed to crawl out and were now making a desperate run for the Dutch border. The sentry was in the shadow of the wall and I could not see him. A bright full moon shone out and absolute stillness reigned. The rye was very ripe and crackled badly. Reaching the visa, we got our clothes off as quickly as possible. The current was very strong. Once safely across, daylight was not far off. Half an hour's walking took us into the woods. 
We were free, and now had a chance of pitting our brains against the Hun, although the odds were greatly in their favor. Back in the tunnel, the 30th escapee was worming his way through when catastrophe struck. Ah! Ah! When they dug up to the end of the tunnel, they dug the slope steeply in a certain way, and as the officers had got out and scrambled up, they'd knocked earth back down to the bottom of the tunnel. It started to fill the tunnel in, and it reached the point where uh, one of the escapees was trapped by this earth and couldn't get out. Four men were now trapped underground. Hindered by bulky clothing and baggage, they found it impossible to push their way back. In the darkness and confusion, they started to suffocate. <laughs> the air began to get very bad. There was now so much noise it was not possible to communicate with those behind and tell them to go back. We waited and waited. I could feel myself getting weaker. Being buried alive is one of those fundamental human fears. Think of the panic of that. Think of the panic of the earth around you and the, the people behind you, the earth coming down. It's, you can imagine, almost scrabbling, desperate to get out. I think it's a horrifying death. We had to wait in that suffocating place for more than two hours before the man who entered last gave up and got out. The next man then started back, and the next. Dawn was now breaking and there was only an hour left before the first inspection. The remaining 55 men on the escape list returned to their quarters, hoping their comrades would get as far as they could before the plot was discovered. But two men were still trapped underground. So the decision was made to leave two men in the tunnel while the remainder closed down the chamber and made their way back to their rooms so that all would appear normal when the guard made his six o'clock inspection. Once the six o'clock inspection had been completed, the men returned to the tunnel, and after hard work and great effort, they managed to drag these two men out of the tunnel. I thought I should never manage it, but I struggled on, and by and by, I felt someone pulling my feet. The men at the entrance had formed a human chain and were hauling us out. And they walk out of the, of the, the, the block where the tunnel's being dug, and the first person they see is the camp commandant. And so they sort of, they just front it out. They style it out. They give him a bit of a salute. They, I mean, he doesn't notice that they're covered in dirt. He doesn't notice the escape at that point. He goes off and he wanders around. It was only when a group of irate farmers appeared at the gates of the camp, complaining that their crops had been trampled, that he actually began to realize what had happened. Nehemiah raged and ordered the prisoners to dig up the entire tunnel. He had always bragged that Holtzminden was an escape-proof camp. Now he was faced with the horrific realization that 29 men had disappeared, and his anger knew no bounds. Niemeyer launched a massive manhunt using dogs and mounted cavalry, offering a reward for the return of any escapee, dead or alive. For the 29 officers on the run, Breaking out was just the first part of the escape plan. They now had to make a deadly 240 kilometer dash across enemy territory to neutral Holland. The whole of the German population was against them and potentially was going to hand them in. And I include the children because the Germans had a practice once they'd been in escape of actually giving the school children the day off so they could help look for them. And they pretty much mobilized the whole of the civilian population. And to get through this screen of people was incredibly difficult. It meant they had to lie up by, uh, by day, move by night, and pretty much avoid all built up areas. In passing through the village of Munsterbrock, some villagers evidently did not like the look of us and started to give chase. On doubling around, we spotted a gate over which we jumped and got down behind a thick hedge. The hue and cry in a moment or two going past on the road at full blast. With the entire local population involved in the manhunt, 
19 POW officers were recaptured within days and brought back to Holzminden to face trial and solitary confinement. But there were still 10 men on the run. The means by which they hoped to reach the border were as varied as the men were, and some were astonishing feats of ingenuity. I think the most ingenious escape attempt from the camp to the Dutch border was by this trio of airmen, Blaine, Kennard and Gray. One of them spoke excellent German, one of them spoke moderate German, and one didn't speak German at all. So they came up with this brilliant idea of pretending that the one who didn't speak German was insane, and that actually they were on their way to this mental asylum, which was on the, very close to the Dutch border. And the one who spoke no German at all became the lunatic and put on a tremendous performance whenever they passed through a village when he would be given his pacifying medicine and aspirin and after a fit would lie on the ground for a few minutes unconscious apparently and then uh, resume normal behaviour and be led away. And so terrified were the villagers of lunatics that they were never approached and they were three of the men who completed a successful crossing of the border. Like the majority of the officers, Gray, Blaine and Kennard made their way on foot toward the border reaching Holland 12 days after their escape. But one man had a different plan. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Rathborn was the senior British officer at Holzminden. As a fluent German speaker, he was able to board a train and travel undetected. He was the first of the escaping POWs to score a home run, reaching Holland just five days after the breakout. When Colonel Rathborn makes it, to neutral Holland, he sends back a charming telegram to Niemeyer, pointing out quite succinctly that he'll break Niemeyer's neck if he ever finds him. In all, 10 POW officers made it back successfully, the last returning to England just over three weeks after escaping from Holzminden. The tunnelers were welcomed home as heroes, and news of their exploits did much to boost the nation's battered morale. It is, if you like, the first great escape of the First World War. And in the number of men who broke out, 29, and the number who completed successful home runs across the Dutch border, 10, it is by far the greatest and most successful escape of the entire First World War. By November 1918, the world was back at peace. Former Holzminden inmates built a damning case against Commandant Niemeyer. He was placed on a British government most wanted list, but managed to evade capture. He's meant to have committed suicide in either a restaurant or a, a Dresden flat. Um, I suspect he, he either went back to the States or went to South America. I suspect he, unfortunately, I think he probably vamoosed and um, got away. Though the Holzminden tunnelers are today largely forgotten, their daring and inventive escape remains an inspirational example of courage and persistence in the face of adversity. story and we continue to mark the 70th anniversary next tonight with revealed the great escape stay right where you are <laughs>